then I have to take attendance as well at some point. Um, and I will I will remember to do that, I think. And AJ, welcome. Glad you can make it as well. Let's see today. Who did I else did I miss here? Looking down on my list. Kimmy, welcome. I don't think I've said hi to you yet. And Miranda, Rihanna. Sheila, good to see you, Sheila. All right, and it's 105, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, again, there are people on the call who have a lot more experience and understanding who've done uh, research on this, who have had experiences in their class and situations have seen, heard things that I'm going to miss. Um, and thank you for being here. Thank you for um, stepping in as you all feel comfortable uh, doing so. This is for me personally a very difficult topic. Um, there's shame in sort of not being aware um, for a long time and still I'm sure not being as as aware of the inequities and the privilege that I have um, and the inequities that I that I contribute just in following the status quo and living my life the way that I have um, uh, past complicity. Uh, there's shame in not knowing exactly what to do with this. Uh, there's fear of of making mistakes and missteps um, and um, either coming down too strong without, you know, fully understanding what it is that I'm contributing to, um, calling the people out, making them upset, shutting down conversations, um, especially because I don't have it all figured out and and recognition that I, you know, the, the most vocal that I can do won't be probably vocal enough um, for some people. It's an ongoing process um, to recognize and address inequities in our lives and today's focused especially on in our courses and the courses uh, that we're involved in. Um, and yet it's very obvious uh, that it's that we need to address it, that I need to address it. Um, it's clear that our campus needs to uh, address it um, be, and our society uh, needs to address it. Welcome, Peter. Um, it's not something that I can do by myself, work on by myself, because I'm just a drop in the bucket and the best efforts that I have will be nothing without the help of, of uh, a, a more collective thing. Recognizing that inequities and, and racism are systemic through society, um, that our individual efforts won't be enough, um, so that we need to sort of systemize um, inequity. And, and anti racism. So that's kind of my incomplete preamble, uh, if you will. And um, I, again, I want to thank you all for uh, jumping in and, and helping me um, today as we figure out how to address this um, and how do we build, in, uh, build equity and belonging into our course? How do we recognize what's inequitable about? our current approaches. Um, and again, it won't just be in your course. It'll be in the systems that your course is stuffed into. Um, it'll be in your department. It'll be in uh, the school, in the housing situation that our students are in, in their lives that they, li that they live. Um, so even the best that we can do within our small sphere of influence uh, won't be enough. But what can we do to help normalize equitable practices. Um, in the link, uh, let's see, there it is for Raphael. Um, the, we have a, a link to the activity sheet here. Again, this activity sheet is editable by you all. Um, you are all um, invited to help contribute to this. At the beginning, I usually try to come up with sort of a as I prep for these labs, I, I try to come up with an overview that's a little bit different from so many of the other overviews that are out and available. And oh my gosh, if you saw how many tabs I had opened today and yesterday and the day before, um, and you compare that with how many tabs I had opened up um, in last September when I when we looked at this topic for labs again, um, 
there's been so much happening and that's fantastic. The awareness is. Increasing. And so the, as the awareness increases, the resources are starting to, to show up. I recognize that as you look at this sheet, it will look overwhelming. Um, and yet it still won't be enough. There are a lot of words here and um, I'm trying to sort of simplify it in some ways. So as sort of an overview, number one, get comfortable with discomfort. Um, we often feel like we have a right to be comfortable and that um, to be respected, we need to have that right respected, I guess. Um, and I want to push back against that um, and invite you to also sort of lean into that discomfort. Um, think about a really good workout, like it's exhausting, it's very uncomfortable. And yet at the end, you've improved. Your body is better, your health is better. Um, good learning can be difficult and uncomfortable, but at the end, you're smarter for having gone through that. So try to lean into that. Enlist a friend and journey together. I will tell you that it can feel very isolating. And again, I'm speaking personally um, to try to figure out what can we do by, what can I do by myself um, and what's happening? And I miss out so many things. But by having a trusted friend jump in with me, um, they point out things that I miss all the time. They offer suggestions. Um, we help each other. We support each other. It's good. Um, be aware, and this is where we have to start recognizing that um, there are things that we just have to sort of look at and admit um, that this exists us around us all over the place. The activity sheet really focuses a lot on anti-racist behaviors. Um, and I'll tell you for a while, um, I was actively discouraged from talking about anti-racist and I will, I, I, I felt more comfortable not talking about it, talking about systems and equity and looking even at um, disability and uh, LGBTQ um, issues and things like that. Um, as a hetero cis white male, I always felt like there are things that I'm just not able to talk to and this is actually one of the things that I am very un underqualified at, at, at uh, talking about. Um, so I'm again asking uh, you all to jump in and help me figure it out on our, uh, together. Unpacking white supremacy culture. I want to really highlight this because this is really um, the article that did it for me. Um, I read through that uh, the link, the white supremacy culture essay by uh, Tima Okun, and it was very hard for me to read. I saw a lot of things in there that I'm like, oh, perfectionism, but perfectionism is good. And until I really was able to unpack what was involved in perfectionism, it was like I, I clung to that. And I was like, no, this, this, this isn't, it's not white supremacy culture. It's just an unfortunate situation in reality that I'm in. Um, although it is, in my estimation, very much aligned with, sure enough, this is the culture that we're swimming in. and. This is the result of that, so let's look at that and, and unpack that. Um, and then do a lot of research. Again, there are 100 tabs open on my computer that uh, we can look at. A lot of these links, a lot of them are linked here below. It's a big lift. It's a lot of work. Once we're aware, do something. Um, and this is, uh, you know, I really love this idea that you can try to be non racist, but that's kind of like not doing a damn thing. Um, it's just avoiding doing something. Um, it's much more important to be. Um, anti racist. Um, and I feel like in some ways the same thing you could just be said uh, can be said about any sort of inequities that we see and face. We can try to say, oh, well, I would never do that, but how can we step in and change the situation where they're happening, where these things are happening? Employ antidotes to the West uh, white supremacy culture. Um, in that list of uh, white characteristics of white supremacy culture uh, that Tima Okun discusses, um, she includes antidotes. And this is the part that I have mixed feelings about that. Down below, here we have 132 teaching practices 
um, that are that are antidotes to characteristics of the white supremacy culture. So here's 24 things on um, perfectionism and you know things that you can do in your classroom, concrete practices that if you make it part of the norm, we can hopefully systematize and normalize equitable practices um, instead. That's my hope. If you look at the list of 132 things and then you read the um, article, you'll see that one of uh, one of our characteristics is progress is bigger and better quantity over quality. I recognize that having a list of 132 things and wanting it to be a list of 300 things that we can do that feeds right into that like, oh, let's solve all this problem by throwing lots of things at it. Um, please forgive me for that. <laughs> uh, but that's it's again, it's hard for me to get out of that. So we'll do something. We'll disrupt um, question and disrupt the status quo. Um, but then we have to like systematize and normalize inclusion and equitable practices. Um, one of the quick ways of doing that ask our students to join in, make it about them instead of about us, um, because we in many ways. I in many ways and the history and traditions that I've navigated and gone through in higher education. Promotes the status quo. That's all part of the structure and for me to break that structure. I need to move it away from me towards my students. Um, towards other people's lived experiences. Um, I really like this framework. It gets a little bit academic, but um, basically the idea of the framework and it's the WRCFB framework uh, by Jayla Haynes. Um, is my teaching restrictive or is it expansive? And there's some fun things down here, um, six or seven different examples that uh, she talks about in that article um, that I've got examples of here. Um, and then finally, and, and this might be the one that can be most useful at a campus level. I'm spitballing here, um, but I like design thinking because it comes through and it focuses on the user uh, the most. So to find that there's a liberatory design thinking, design thinking for equity, and that it's a structure focused on higher education um, by folks at UCLA, that was to me like, all right, this is something we can grab onto and fit into structures and systems um, for bigger change. So that's what I have for my overview. And then you saw down below there were 132 things, practical things that you can think of. This is too much for us to unpack right now. And what I'd really like to do is um, open it up right now to thoughts and questions. I'll invite you to uh, you can raise your hand if you'd like. You can unmute and jump in if you have something to, to, to say, a question you'd like us to address. You can also put your questions on this right hand column here, left hand column. Um, and again, as we go through this, I encourage you to add to the right hand column as well uh, with your ideas and thoughts. And I've talked a lot, so let me pull away from right now uh, right now and uh, offer some time for things to happen. All right. Um, let's just start off at the first question here that um, we're and getting. John, yes. that's not hey, a little high question. <laughs> All right. I've been thinking about this talk a lot. about it then. <laughs> I've been thinking about it a lot lately. Um, um, I just some background. I teach most of the courses I teach are for people who are preparing to be school administrators. And um, yeah, I guess I've been doing this for 12 years now and I typically teach the class about race. <laughs> uh, 
and you know working at predominantly white institutions um, my entire career um, and m most of my students are you know are white and um, I mean well education you know in terms of who is teaching um, students and leading students is mostly white and so um, yeah I think a lot about this like making sure that um, I'm making spaces for, you know, um, uh, racial uh, students with racially minoritized identities in these discussions, and trying, to, you know, trying to make sure that the the learning of my white students, you know, isn't dominating the space, and it's complicated, and that I'm attuning to um, <clears throat> the needs of of my racially minoritized uh, students or, or BPOC students. Um, yeah, so even though I've, I've been doing this a while, I, it's, it's still something that I wrestle with, um, even at my, my own identity as a, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, a, I'm, I'm a black woman and the things I'm teaching about um, affect me, affect my identity <laughs> um, and being, you know, teaching in a predominantly white space, so. Yeah, I'm just curious people's thoughts. Um. All right. <laughs> I see Great. people, someone's already gotten, responded to my question, but yeah. Yeah, this is my question. <laughs> Thank you, and, and and Jerome, thanks for jumping in um, with, with, with one suggestion there. Um, do you go ahead and, and Jerome, uh, tell us what you're talking about here. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, I feel, <laughs> I feel the challenge. Um, I, I teach Anto 104, which is uh, um, the one of the biggest, I think the biggest uh, ethnic studies requirement course on campus. And so we teach about race and racism to a very large uh, group of students about 800 to 900 each semester. Um, the majority of them are, uh, of course, white students. We also have international students who struggle to connect with this material. And we have uh, BIPOC students who have experienced the effect of structural racism uh, themselves, often in a very intimate and violent ways. Um, my answer it is maybe a, a bit obvious, but as a, as a someone who teaches in anthropology and the social sciences, we do have some tools, some vocabularies, uh, some concepts that we can uh, teach our students, and that hopefully, if we do it right, uh, help our uh, students of color to kind of name things that they've experienced uh, themselves. It validates their their experience uh, at the same times at at um, shining a light on structural inequ inequities and inequalities that uh, some of our students who, who benefit from white privilege may be blind to. So it's it's a much more complex uh, topic than this. And, and my answer is just kind of a beginning uh, way of, of thinking about this. I also think that um, having an inclusive curriculum so uh, making sure that uh, you know when we teach uh, the work of other scholars, we, we teach the work of BIPOC scholars and that our students know that we're teaching uh, the work of uh, people who have been minoritized in academic spaces so that they can see themselves and the voices that they learn about and that they learn from, uh, that also will create a more inclusive space overall so that's what i try to do amongst many other things uh but just what i have to uh propose at this point excellent good anyone else have thoughts ideas on on this um oh rihanna go ahead Hi, um, I'm not an instructor, I'm an advisor. I just find instruction kind of interesting. And I was a student here at UW-Madison for both my undergrad and graduate um, career. And I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, and so this is, I don't know how helpful this is, but I've been thinking about if we truly want to disrupt the system of white supremacy um, in our classrooms, then we would teach 
curriculum that wasn't only for the target centering whiteness, right? Um, so what I so I saw an example of this. Austin Channing Brown came and and did a um, um, a forum here of a workshop here for us, and she her whole her whole thing, her whole presentation was talking to black women. That was her target audience. And that's what she prepared her responses to talk about. Um, and so at the same time, she's you know focusing on black women. Everybody that attended benefited in some way, right? You don't have to be a black woman to benefit from what Austin Channing Brown had to say at this presentation. So what if we disrupted the system where we, you know, sort of removed what do white students need to learn about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and to really support what do our students of color need to learn in this space, um, and provide maybe some additional resources for students um, that that maybe. Um, need a, a little more support, they some option make those readings the optional readings rather than the optional readings be the works the by people of color, right? Um, do things like that. Of course, that's that's that is probably a pretty significant and radical shift at this point, but um, I like to think of it like how do I inch a little bit more closely to what Austin Channing Brown did? And that's that's I love that. It, uh, one of the things in universal design, and, and I, JT is, is on the on the in the, in the session with me. Um, I think he put this in um, our activity sheets on universal design for learning. The idea is if we design for the edges, we design then the people in the middle, they're covered. You know, they'll get it. So can we highlight the um, the non mainstream or you know the non traditional? Um, on on both sides, and and then we'll understand. You know, it, it in some ways. Um, what's the other one? The the example the the aircraft air force um, pilot seat, right? Instead of designing a seat for the person who was always in the aircraft, you know, from day one, who had to be you know five foot ten, not five foot eleven, not five foot nine, but five foot ten, and weigh exactly this much weight, you know, for their body size. Why don't we design an aircraft seat that is that fits the four foot two pilot as well as the six foot five pilot. And then the five eleven person is going to fit fine. Um, I, I really like that idea. Thank you for sharing that. Good. Other thoughts there, please. All right, and I I am. Um, I added the uh, if we can normalize um, in the structure of our courses putting students first, asking them to go out and find relevant things in the world that they see, a lot more will come to us that is relevant to them than what we can come up with in our own minds. Uh, we can bring our, our own ideas there as well, do our own research as well to try to cover the basis, but if we invite our students to do that, we will get more basis covered. We'll get more of those edge cases, I guess, um, in the conversations than if we just Try to do it ourselves. Um, so that's a that's sort of what I was trying to get at with, the, 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 with that part. I see exploring a balance of individual writing and reflection uh, to group discussion, and that's that's another that's great. Again, applicable across the board, regardless of your topic, regardless of what your focus is of the unit or the of the day. Um, it gets the students to connect the content to their own lived experiences, um, and hopefully then extrapolate that to other lived experiences that they are hearing and seeing about as well. The acknowledgement I think is really important um, in providing space for that. Um, and again, I'd encourage multimodalities in that space. So not just um, as we're doing today saying, all right, somebody raise your hand and talk to us about that because that asks people to be in a very vulnerable position. But can you provide an opportunity for them to write it asynchronously? Um, can you provide an opportunity for them to sit on it for a day or two before they come forward with that? Maybe it can be a, a journal that is only sent out to you. Maybe it's a small group discussion where they've had a chance to build trust uh, with each other. Um, there's lots of different strategies for that. 
affinity spaces. Um, when I first heard about affinity spaces, it was in the realm of uh, games and learning. So people who liked one kind of game would get together and they would get on the fandom pages of that game and they would all talk about that. And it was people from you know all different reaches talking about one particular thing. I'm hearing it more and more about um, race, talking about race and inequity. Um, so black affinity groups, white affinity groups, uh, BIPOC affinity groups, LGBTQ affinity groups um, coming together. And at first glance, when I ran across that, I was like, oh, but then I'm not learning from other people. I recognize that that's OK for now. And there's a lot I need to do without putting it on those other people to like be stuck in a group with me and have to deal with all my dumb questions as I learn about that. So yeah, that's affinity groups is another one. OK, same question for professional development. Well, here we are, folks. Um, <laughs> in a professional development series, the Active Teaching Labs, um, how do we develop that space? How can we make it a classroom space, but not a passive receive classroom space, I'm hearing? Um, I'm not familiar with the National Seed Project, but I'm going to be. Thank you for sharing that. Um, can somebody tell me a little bit more about that as they, uh, somebody who's looked into that? Hi, John. Yes, uh, the National Seed Project is actually led by um, different uh, teachers and uh, faculty that have been pretty much kind of like trained into specific topics. Um, and the nice things about this uh, activity is that it's a workshop that will be taking over several weeks of your uh, calendar. So you're kind of like building community over time with the group and they provide kind of like different topics every week. Uh, they provide some readings um, and that opens a lot for discussions uh, during the group meetings. Um, most of the discussions will take place on based on what the uh, the audience is presenting. So you could start talking about your experience, sharing how you experience racism, for example, how you see racism. And the great thing is that you're going to have a combination of people from different uh, races so they can talk about how they how they see things from basically from uh, the meter, right? How they can see things being reflected and how they can see through the meter uh, and, and how others are uh, affected by that. Um, for example, this one, uh, I participated in the workshop that was led by a faculty member um, in uh, Madison College. It's actually a, 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 has been trained with the program and they offered these activities to different uh, institutions and even um, different entities, uh, private and public entities. So I think it's a great combination of building community and kind of like as you mentioned at the beginning, getting more used to some of those topics that are very difficult to us. And there are many things that we have experienced that we're not aware that we're actually being, that we could potentially be racist in a way. Uh, that's kind of like bias that we are not aware constantly that we're doing something that could be affecting our students. And that's the kind of like the main concern, just to open your mind to some of those topics and get familiar with them so you can uh, have a, a, a genuine conversation with your students or uh, fellow colleagues. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Rafael, for, for sharing that. Um, okay. And it reminds me that um, on campus here, there's the Leadership Institute, um, and I had a chance to be a part of that last year now. It ended. It ended last spring, um, but it, it's uh, it had a lot of the affinity groups. We'd get together, we'd discuss issues. That's where I ran across the Team Okun article, and it was fantastic. Um, no, so great. for self development, that's a um, really good awareness building thing. I see Lisa that your hand is up. Please uh, forgive me. I don't know how long it was up, but uh, please jump in. Oh, sure. Thanks. Um, I recently participated in a training that was um, for um, facilitating um, a learning community around inclusive teaching and one of their reflection strategies, the facilitators reflection strategies was um, to actually, um, I guess, how should I describe this? They 
the the topic was inclusive teaching in STEM courses. So they kind of um, broke down um, different attitudes that people might bring to the topic, such as a belief in meritocracy. Um, I'm not going to remember the the list of items, but you can kind of get the idea that it's um, they took, um, you know, the types of resistance people might have like, oh, it's, you know, to teach inclusively is to evacuate rigor from your course, things like that. Right. Um, and they put each of those kind of beliefs or ideologies on a slide or a jam board or, you know, any tool where you can kind of um, have people go in and um, populate the page with um, ideas. And the question was like, I think the overriding question was like, um, if you bring this belief into your teaching or whatever your role is, like, how does that um, prevent you from developing an inclusive learning community or prevent you from um, developing an inclusive classroom? So I thought that was an interesting way to um, facilitate reflection and it was they happened to use Jamboard so all this um, which is a digital sticky board tool so all the reflections or ideas that people put in were anonymous um, uh, so I guess I just offer that up as a way of like facilitating reflection that could be in a group setting and be subject to group discussion but people's contributions would be anonymous yeah and that's I think that that's a an important element to this, especially as when group trust isn't fully formed, uh, which you know could be for some groups a very short amount of time, for other classes it could be the whole semester or one's entire lives. Um, but that ability to have to, to be able to participate uh, without sharing your your name, you know, to and and to be able to have some time to think about what you're going to say or what you type before you hit submit or before you um, put it on the Jamboard um, sticky note. Um, I think of that. That can be very useful. Um, I'm very good, I think to myself at coming up with ideas right away, but that's actually just that I'm very good at talking and then figuring out what it is I'm saying while I'm talking and that's a big different thing. I think I'm much smarter when I have a chance to type things out, think about it for a second, and then do that. Um, and that's uh, my way of apologizing to all of you for thinking about things as I'm talking through them. But yeah, what anonymous uh, ways platforms can we have for that? And again, the different modalities. Um, small group discussions is another one um, versus a whole class discussion. And that's true whether the class is uh, for professional development with your colleagues or for students. Good. Anyone else have thoughts and ideas on this? Yeah, another thing that struck me about that activity I participated in was that the facilitators were taking, you know, these in this case, like beliefs that um, they want to explicitly address and have people understand why um, they would hamper their their instruction or their professional development. Um, and I think in some past contexts, I have just been kind of hanging on and just hoping nobody says something that is problematic um, rather than um, necessarily uh, naming those beliefs and getting them out in the open and providing a way for people to discuss and reflect on them in a way that isn't, um, you know, me as the instructor hoping nothing bad happens. Right, and it's a, it's a, the, the flip side of that coin is that participants may not want to say something for fear of saying something that is wrong. And, you know, that's not only embarrassing in front of a, a, a group, but it's also challenging because the realizing realization that, oh my gosh, I've been holding this belief without examining it, like that's a 
that's a that's bigger than a class period, right? That's a change in one's personality, one's value systems, one's life that one needs to unpack and address. And that's, you know, sometimes it's, it feels like it's safer to just hold your breath and hope that nobody talks about the things that you hold, you know, as values. Um, and so we try to get through um, situations on a lot of life um, across the board, uh, topics across the board, hoping that I don't have to unpack that because that's going to be a big mess for me to unpack as a, as a human. So yeah, thanks. Um, it's a space that requires vulnerability. It requires bravery. It requires support so that when people do s make those missteps and those mistakes, there's somebody there to, to say, I understand I was there as well. I am still there. I'm still struggling with these kinds of things. Um, here's how I am working with it. Um, here are some dead ends that I took, uh, dead, dead end routes that I took in, in figuring that out. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult space uh, across the board, and yet we need to do it, and yet we need to move forward. All right, the next one to address. Uh, for courses explicitly teaching about race and racism and white supremacy, um, what are effective practices, articles, resources for developing and assessing student writing? Oh, I like that specific specificity. Um, this is a question both about pedagogy and about how um, you as an instructor um, <laughs> survive and whether the grading process um, and feedback process in dialogue with various positionalities and identities. Um, so yeah, there's an acknowledgement that um, as instructors, we are not autonomous robots with no feelings and no positionalities, that we all approach our teaching spaces and teaching practice with our own intersectional identities. Um, and some of those are very privileged and some of those are not seen as having a lot of, of privilege. Um, by our students, by society. Um, so figuring that out and negotiating that is, is, is another question. Well, is this question? I see somebody typing something in um, as Sarah continues to type. Um, does anyone else have any immediate thoughts about that that they'd be willing to to jump in and uh, talk about? Yeah, this is my question. Um, I'm not currently in an instructional role, but I, I previously taught first year writing courses and um, kind of had this sort of evolution towards um, or away from having a very um, general theme in my courses, like we're going to learn about writing to actually having it be uh, the text centered on issues of history and identity in American culture and history. Um, so, so teaching about race and racism ended up being very front and center for me. Um, and yeah, this was the writing piece in a way was the kind of nut I feel like I didn't really crack. I felt like I got, you know, decent with facilitating discussion, but um, the writing piece was challenging because I think, um, you know, students are developing in their ability to analyze whatever text they chose to analyze. And in that process, they, they may be instantiating things that, uh, you know, I, weren't necessarily coming up in classroom discussions where um, I don't know if it was because they were in a group setting and there were kind of group interactions mediating what was happening. But I found that it was more challenging to give feedback when the feedback might have been something along the lines of maybe you're interpreting this text in a way that instantiates certain racist beliefs and 
you know, I had rubrics, but the rubrics were really about argument and analysis and not about um, maybe not specific to the subject matter at hand. I, th I think it's 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 difficult to ha have a, a rubric on this kind of development and in in, in one's life. Um, and for sure, traditional education has always been about content. I'm using their quotes here rather than about the context of the content. And it's the content that we've often seen as, oh, it's neutral. I'm teaching calculus. There's no race in calculus. There's no race in my uh, or inequity in, you know, in the purity of mathematics. Um, and we, we try to sort of protect ourselves and hide behind that shield um, without recognizing that the context of looking at the situation, uh, whatever our topic is, um, is all over the place. And uh, so we cannot have, you know, a pure academic look to it without looking at the positionality and impact on our students and on our. Um, and the way that we give it, uh, the way that we present the information. Can I Sarah, jump in here a little bit? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so I had exactly this. Thank you for putting my question into words because part of my question was, you know, how do I you know, we need to meet all of our students where they are and help them grow. And some of the people who we need to meet are coming out of a very of a background that is very much steeped in these kinds of um, white supremacist and other ideas. Um, and one thing I've started experimenting with um, is including adding a learning outcome to my classes that isn't that something like uh, participates productively and respectfully in discussion or um, gives and receives feedback in an effective and respectful manner or something like that so that there's so that one of the actual explicit learning outcomes is about this kind of interaction and then I can repeatedly come back to it when I talk about different assignments or when I'm in the grading rubrics or in, you know, throughout the semester as we occasionally look back at what are the learning outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Um, and then we can have multiple discussions about it that way. So that might be one strategy to um, open up the space to be able to respond to the, those kinds of issues in a way that the student sees as now legitimate because now you've linked it explicitly to a learning, a desired learning outcome. For what it's worth. <laughs> yes, yes, and this is where I really love the Wisconsin idea and the um, the four pillars of the Wisconsin idea. Um, empathy and humility, relentless curiosity, intellectual confidence and purposeful action. Um, it's so much better put together in those four things because those are four things that we can say this is not just a soft skill that you should learn in order, soft skill, that you should learn in order to be a better whateverologist that 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 my field is or a writer or whatever. Those are kind of um, values that just about every uh, profession needs. We want our colleagues to be uh, empathetic, right? We want our colleagues to have some humility about what they do and do not know. We want our colleagues to um, be curious and ask questions to get input from people that they might not automatically assume uh, understand. We want them to have uh, the confidence to bring forward their ideas, even if the ideas are not fully baked, even if they're still in process. And we want them to be driven, um, you know, by a need to make the world a better, a better place. Sarah, your hand is still up, is it, or is it up again? And if it's up again, please join us again. No, I'm still I I've used teams for more than a year now and still don't know how to make it work. So thanks. I'll well, take it down. That's, <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Excellent. Um, great. 
Let's add that Wisconsin experience there. And then, yes, thank you for bringing that resource up at the top further up. Um, whoever did that, teaching race, racism, and racial justice. Um, and I want to point to the very bottom underneath this ridiculous list of individual uh, concrete practices that you can do. There are other resources. If you have other resources on um, concrete practices or even general approaches that you'd like to include, there's a lot down here for you to unpack over the next several years um, and uh, continue to look back on, um, but please also add your ideas and your thoughts to this as well. All right, heading back up to the table here. And we got this question here. Any, first of all, before we move on, are there any other thoughts about um, questions about pedagogy and how you grade and provide feedback? Actually, I want to ask for your thoughts on um, the, prov the process of grading and providing feedback and how can we bring more um, teaching into the feedback? So it's not just summative feedback, but we're actually encouraging them to uh, dig in further. And how do we do that in a way that is not exhausting? Um, I guess for us, for the instructor. And I guess one idea is, is uh, student to students, letting the students um, comment on and connect with and help each other and support each other if we are able to create a supportive environment in our classroom. Jerome, go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to go back to this uh, question about providing feedback on, on writing. Uh, I am the person who put a comment about the need to acknowledge that this person would, uh, the, the burden would be very different depending on the identity and position of the instructor with regards to the identity and positions of the students that they are responding to. So there's all kinds of different dynamics that could be uh, in place and that will, are going to be negotiated every time an instructor uh, comments on uh, any sort of assignment that has to do with race and racism. Uh, one of the things that the the article on teaching race and racial justice um, suggests is that from the get-go people actually acknowledge how positionality is going to play out in the classroom by asking questions you know yeah i'm going to be here here's who i am i bring all of this to the classroom how will you react to someone like me teaching you about this how would you react to someone who may look different than me teaching about this? How do you position yourself in these conversations? What do you bring? Um, and, and asking students uh, and including yourself in this reflection at the beginning of a conversation or you know, if it's the beginning of the semester, uh, so that a lot of things that, be, that remain implicit and, and sort of underground, unstated, uh, are made explicit and then we can uh, address them as a class um someone made a comment and asked about peer review i will say that <laughs> when it comes to these topics and given the different demographics of our student population on campus i would be very careful about what that could turn out to mean um you know um examples of students of color whose work is completely ignored by the white student who's supposed to peer review them uh or who, uh, you know, white students would get defensive when a, a student of color makes the suggestions on their writing. The, the dynamics of race and racism are going to be present and active in our classrooms. So when we ask students to engage in any sort of group collaborations, we need to be very attentive to how that activity is actually itself going to be shaped by the dynamics of, of uh, racism. Ab absolutely, and and I really like what AJ just put in the the chat about making it part of the rubric and having that having those discussions um, together as a class 
in some ways, that's bound to help uh, mitigate some of those uh, experiences that that you've talked about that I'm sure that we've all seen or experienced. Many of us have experienced it directly. Um, and you know, I've I have experienced those with my un uh, uh, unlooked at assumptions uh, in, in doing that as well. So thank you for sharing that. Um, it it also helps me in your comment about um, putting your own positionality front and center in the class um, reminds me of uh, Chris Emden and I've got a response da, 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 unabashedly. There it is. Um, Chris Emden is uh, lovely to watch and uh, he's got a lot of videos on this link in the site um, about Pentecostal pedagogy and uh, being a, a ratchetemic. And he talks about bringing yourself as you are and just being very direct and un, unabashedly um, who you are and saying, this is who I am, this is how I teach, this is what I am passionate about. Bringing that to the classroom authentically is much preferable to um, sort of standing off and saying, um, I think that we're going to talk about this, I'm not comfortable about it. Um, it's sort of uh, go with what you know and you recognize that it's going to be problematic for some people. Um, but if we're all very open and honest about where we are and open to feedback, hopefully we'll be able to get those things on the table as Lisa was talking about earlier um, and talk about them rather than hoping that they don't come up. All right, yeah, go check out. Go check out Chris Emden. He's. I saw him as a keynote speaker at a conference last year, and since then I've been like, oh, this is good. All right, other practices. What do you do? Um, I want to point everybody again down to my list of 132 teaching practices uh, that you can do. And again, I want to emphasize that the more that we can structure our classes. Built bake into the course rhythm that. Um, we're putting student experiences first. We are supporting each other. We are rewarding people supporting each other. Um, we do not want perfectionism. Bring your half baked bad ideas. Bring it out forward and let's talk about that um, and 130 uh, other things that we can do. The more that we can make that the norm, the expected part of our course, I think we're bound to do better than what we're doing right now um, as a campus um, and as a society. Um, so those are some things that I have. And again, in the last three minutes, I invite other people to jump up and um, raise your hand unmute and share some more ideas. Angela, thank you. Go ahead. Hello, hello. I have to get all the technology working here. Um, yeah, I guess I that's definitely a question uh, I come back to a lot as a, you know, one of the STEM lab course where there's a lot going on. And I think I do a lot of things that are centered around like creating community and inclusivity in a in the way it's set up where students are working together and things that we've talked about um, or that have popped up today are things I try to do to like really uh, make collaboration part of the rubric or you know giving students a chance to really uh, take ownership um, but as other people you know we're not really talking it's it's how do you do a western blot you know it's like there's not really people in a lot of our conversations um, but as a one thing I've been thinking about this semester, just like really little ways. Um, I think Jerome or someone was just mentioning like being your authentic self and you know, putting yourself in your teaching. Sometimes I think even really simple things like this is really dorky, but uh, it was Chinese New Year back in January. And so like I sent a thing out. I grew up in San Francisco, so like I loved going and watching celebrations. And so just put that, which was something from me that was authentic, but also like totally off topic as a, you know, announcement for the week. And uh, like I had a, a couple um, Asian American students who reached out and they were like, oh man, no one's ever like wished Happy New Year or Lunar New Year. And like they were just 
I don't know, like it was a little tiny thing, totally felt throwaway. Like I just, I wanted to share a YouTube video of a, a, a dragon dance, <laughs> like, but it like can affect people. So I think even when you're teaching where it's not the center of your focus, sometimes those little offhand things that feel kind of silly, but it's still something personal is a way to like make some students feel included in a way you weren't even thinking about. So I just wanted to throw that in the mix as a, a silly thing we can do. In some ways, that's a great example of, of, of uh, teaching to the edges or teaching from a different perspective. Um, and thinking again about um, uh, us and Channing, uh, the, 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 the speaker earlier, where the, the focus is on a, a specific thing. Because we'll have, we'll have no problem in a Western classroom saying Happy New Year with, you know, on December 31st or whatever the holiday is um, and centering that. But what can we do to center some other things in our lives and to showcase people that don't look like the mainstream or traditional education or the the academy um, as it's passed down in, in Western Europe uh, along uh, in, in our courses? What can we do to showcase um, other cultures, other identities um, as well? Hey, it's two o'clock. Uh, thank you all for coming today. I'm going to stick around, but I release you um, out to the world, out to the outside where it's sunny. Um, if you want to keep on talking, I'll stick around for another 10 minutes. Um, thank you again for coming. Thank you for engaging with us. Um, this is again a, a difficult topic uh, for me specifically, um, and I'm imagining for some of you as well. Um, thank you for all the help that you've given me today. And I'll stop the recording and then I'll start looking at chat and I'll be around uh, for folks to 